Pastor John, here's a question from Caden in Boca Raton, Florida. Hello, Pastor John. After seeing the documentary American Gospel, I was conflicted because I'm not sure if I'm supposed to call out false teachers. 2 Peter 2, verses 1 to 3, make it obvious that there will be false teachers. But the text also doesn't say we should point them out. I have heard both sides to this argument, but I'm still not quite sure. I want to be careful not to pronounce judgment before the time. 1 Corinthians 4, 5. Does this passage apply here in this situation? Are we taking a judgment that isn't ours to take? Or should we rest in God's ultimate knowledge? And if a prominent false teacher is to be called out, who does this? Where and how? Maybe it would be helpful to step back first and get the bigger picture of the New Testament response to those who live and teach in ways that lead others into error and ruin, and then zero in on 1 Corinthians 4, 5, and some guidelines for how we should speak and write about such people. So let's begin with Jesus. Matthew seven fifteen. Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. And the word beware means all of us should be alert, but especially shepherds, to identify not just false teaching, but false teachers whose ways are subtle, like they're clothing themselves with lamb's wool while they're wolves. And Paul used the same Greek word for beware in Acts 20 when he said, pay careful attention to yourselves and to all the flock in which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers. I know that after my departure, fierce wolves, same as Jesus, fierce wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock, Acts 20, 28. Jesus used the same word again in Matthew 16, 6, but he got more specific. He said, watch and beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Paul had the same kind of a group in mind, the same kind of error in mind in Philippians 2, uh, no, Philippians 3, uh, verse 2. And verse 18, look out for the dogs. There it is. Look out for the dogs. Look out for the evil workers. Look out for those who mutilate the flesh. In verse 18, for many of whom I have told you often and now tell you even with tears, walk as enemies of the cross of Christ. Then in Romans 16, 17, he warned, watch out. For those who cause divisions and create obstacles contrary to the doctrine that you have been taught, avoid them. To avoid them, you have to know who they are, right? You can't avoid somebody if you don't <laughs> know who they are. Right. This idea of identifying and avoiding shows up in 1 Corinthians 5, 11, 2 Thessalonians 3, 6, uh, verse 14, 2 Timothy 3, 4, 2 John 1, 10. In other words, Christians and shepherds in particular should be discerning and alert to behavior and teaching that dishonors Christ and destroys people and not treat it in a casual or harmless way. And then in 1 Timothy five nineteen, Paul went beyond avoid them to rebuke them publicly. So speaking of elders who persist in error, he said, do not admit a charge against an elder except on the evidence of two or three witnesses. As for those who persist in sin, I think that could be sin of false doctrine or sin of evil behavior, as for those who persist, they don't, they don't accept rebuke. As for those in sin, rebuke them in the presence of all, so that the rest may stand in fear. And then he went on and actually named destructive false teachers. Demas, in love with the present world, has deserted me. Second Timothy 4.10. You are aware that all who are in Asia turned away from me, among whom are Phygelus and Hermogenes, 2 Timothy 
By rejecting faith and a good conscience, some have made shipwreck of their faith, among whom are Hymenaeus and Alexander, 1 Timothy 1.19. Their talk will spread like gangrene. Among them are Philetus, 2 Timothy 2.16. So Paul names at least six false teachers that the church should watch out for. So, I infer from Jesus and Paul and Luke and John that false teaching and destructive behavior are present dangers in this fallen world for the church, and that all of us, especially shepherds, pastors, should be alert and discerning to identify and in appropriate ways expose expose Hmm. in order to protect the flock. We should expose them and minimize the spread of the gangrene, as Paul calls it. Now, in 1 Corinthians 4, 5, Paul is talking about how the Corinthians should assess Paul and Cephas and Apollos because uh, the people are choosing sides and boasting in their favorite teacher. He says, "For, for I am not aware of anything in myself anything against myself, but I am not thereby acquitted. It is the Lord who judges me. Therefore, don't pronounce judgment before the time, before the Lord comes, who will bring to light the things that are now hidden in darkness and will disclose the purposes of the heart. Then each one, Paul, Cephas, Paulus, each one will receive his commendation from God. So, Caden is asking, asking me, asking us, whether the words, do not pronounce judgment before the time, should keep us from identifying false teachers or from naming them. I don't think so. Don't pronounce judgment before the time means don't do what only Christ can do at that last day, before the time, Mm -hmm. that time of, of judgment, the day of judgment. Don't presume to know the heart like Jesus will know the heart on that day. Only Christ will, quote, bring to light the things now hidden in darkness and will disclose the purposes of the heart. But for now, our job is indeed to do mouth judgment, writing judgment, behavior judgment, not heart judgment, but mouth judgment and writing and behavior judgment. When a mouth speaks unbiblical destructive teaching, when a blog or an article or a book publishes unbiblical and destructive teaching, when a body, a human body, a physical body, behaves with unbiblical and destructive behavior, in all these cases, we are to be discerning, and according to Ephesians 5.11, expose the error. It says, take no part in the unfruitful works of darkness, but instead expose them, censure them, show them to be wrong, is what that elenkos word means. So, the question is, how and when, not if. And here, I think the Bible calls for wisdom Rather than telling us who and when and how, the question we ask is, how can we best in our situation with our gifts and our responsibilities, how can we best help most people believe and live the most truth? And how can we protect the most people from destructive beliefs and behaviors? And here are some factors, perhaps, to consider when deciding whether to name a false teacher. The urgency of your naming a false teacher increases. So we've got, what, five factors that would cause the urgency to name would increase if, one, the seriousness and deceitfulness of the error is great. Two, the size of the audience gets bigger. Three, the duration of their ministry. They make one blunder, are they constantly doing it? Four, the vulnerability of the people for whom you are responsible. Five, 
the role you have in influencing shepherds who really need to be discerning for who the false teachers are. And when you do name a false teacher, best to do it in a setting where you do more than name drop. You explain the error. You give reasons for rejecting it. You communicate complexities. You, you set a tone of longing for truth and love. You know, just slinging mud. And the last thing I would say is, let your teaching be so powerful in clarifying the greatness and the beauty and the worth of God's truth that your people will smell error before it infects their lives. David Eels is known for using tactics that confuse and mislead his audience, often by employing what is known as word salad. This term describes a jumble of disorganized words and phrases, in his case a bunch of scriptures and his interpretations, intended to overwhelm and disorient listeners. In his teachings, Eels frequently cites the biblical story of Jonah, claiming that it supports the notion that prophecies can fail if God changes his mind. However, this is a misapplication of the text. Jonah's prophecy about Nineveh is a unique case where God relented from his planned destruction because the people repented, Jonah 3.10. This was an exceptional event rather than a common occurrence in biblical prophecy. Eel's analogy misleads by suggesting that his failed prophecies are comparable to Jonah's experience. The Bible generally holds prophets to high standards, emphasizing that true prophecies are fulfilled as declared. David Eels employs several tactics to defend his failed prophecies, often shifting blame to his followers. One common method is to accuse individuals of lacking faith, suggesting that the prophecy's failure is due to their insufficient belief rather than any fault in his prediction. This manipulation can lead followers to doubt themselves rather than question the accuracy of Eel's prophecies. In a recent instance, Eel's claimed that a failed prophecy about a planetary event was due to the planet inexplicably moving back into outer space, an assertion that defies both logic and scientific understanding. He also argued that God simply changed his mind, a rationale he often uses to explain away inaccuracies in his predictions. Additionally, Eels has been known to falsely attribute his information to credible sources, such as former President Trump, to lend unwarranted credibility to his claims. This tactic further misleads his audience and distorts the truth. Such deceptive practices not only confuse followers, but also undermine their trust in genuine prophetic and spiritual teachings. It is crucial to critically assess these claims and rely on sound, biblically consistent interpretations and verified information sources. However, Eels then contradicts this by suggesting that God can and does delay or change prophetic utterances. He argues that because God has delayed judgments in the past, as recorded in the Bible, he can similarly delay modern prophecies delivered through dreams, visions, or other means. Eels uses this reasoning to justify why certain prophecies he has made have not come to pass, suggesting that they are merely delayed rather than false. This line of reasoning is problematic for several reasons, biblical prophecies and fulfillment. While there are instances in the Bible where God relents from immediate judgment, e.g. the story of Jonah and Nineveh, these are specific and exceptional cases with clear context. They do not establish a general principle that all prophecies are flexible or subject to change. Most biblical prophecies are definitive and fulfilled as stated. Accountability in prophecy. Prophets in the Bible were held to strict standards. Deuteronomy 18.22 states, When a prophet speaks in the name of the Lord, if the thing does not happen or come to pass, that is the thing which the Lord has not spoken. The prophet has spoken it presumptuously, you shall not be afraid of him. This underscores the expectation that true prophecies from God will be fulfilled without the need for reinterpretation or excuses.